Hi everyone, welcome to chapter 17. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at biotechnology and genomics. So what is biotechnology and genomics? Biotechnology is us trying to advance technology using tools and techniques from the biology field. And the primary applications of biotech includes in medicine, things like creating vaccines and antibiotics, in agriculture, trying to increase the yields of different crops through, for instance, building uh, pesticide resistance or cold resistant crops. We also have many different industrial applications such as fermentation to create foods, um, making sure we have different microbes that, can, that might be able to help us treat oil spills and producing biofuels. In contrast, if we look at our second term, genomics, genomics is the study of entire genomes, and we're going to look at this in the second half of the chapter. Genomes include the complete set of genes. Um, this can be their nucleotide sequence, how the genes are organized, and how they interact within the species as well as with other species. It's really DNA sequencing technology that has, have allowed us to study genomics in much more detail. And we can use genomic information to create things like DNA maps of different organisms. This slide shows us an outline of the first section of chapter 17, and this is going to be chapter 17, uh, section 1, 17.1. So I'm going to go through different techniques to manipulate genetic material, including these uh, tools and techniques. We're going to look at cloning, first starting with molecular cloning, then looking briefly at cellular cloning, reproductive cloning, and different types of genetic engineering and how we use biotechnology in medicine and agriculture, including producing vaccines, antibiotics, and different hormones. The first technique described in chapter 17 is DNA and RNA extraction. So if we want to study DNA or RNA or manipulate these nucleic acids, we first have to extract them from the cells. So what we use first is the same thing that we saw in one of our labs recently. We take lysis buffer, which is mostly detergent or some kind of soap-like chemical that breaks down those phospholipids that make up the cell membrane and the nuclear membranes. After we open or lyse these cells, then we treat these cells with enzyme proteases or ribonucleases if we're trying to isolate, for example, DNA. We can get rid of our proteins, get rid of RNA if we need to, so we're only looking at DNA. And the types of enzymes we use and the processes we use really depend on what we're trying to isolate here. Are we trying to isolate DNA or RNA, or sometimes we're even trying to look at proteins instead. The remaining material, what's left over after using these different enzymes, is then centrifuged. So we can separate it in the supernatant com compared to um, the solid material that's usually going to be found at the bottom of the centrifuge tube like the different parts of the enzymes or RNA that have been broken down. And then we add ethanol because DNA is insoluble in ethanol, and that allows DNA to precipitate out of the solution, just as we saw in our DNA extraction lab, and you saw DNA that looked like this white thread coming out of the lysis solution. Here's a summary in terms of a figure. First, I see cells are lysed using some kind of detergent that disturbs the plasma membrane and the nuclear membrane. Then we treat the cell with protease or perhaps RNases to destroy protein and RNA. Then we centrifuge and the debris from the cell is going to be at the bottom and the supernatant, the liquid portion, will have DNA. Then we add ethanol, which precipitates the DNA out of solution, and we can pull that out of the tube, just as we did with, in our case, we used micropipetters. The next technique described in Chapter 17 is something that we've seen before in a previous chapter as well. This one's called gel electrophoresis. So it turns out that DNA can be separated based on size using this procedure, gel electrophoresis. We know that DNA is negatively charged, so if we put it into a gel and apply an electrical current, it'll move towards the positive end of the gel. What we do is we're going to take DNA and break it down into different pieces, these different DNA fragments, 
which we will load into a gel and uh, apply an electrical current. DNA will move down the gel, which acts as a sieve, sorting fragments by size. Small DNA fragments get to move down the gel more quickly than large fragments that get stuck at the top. So the result is we sort DNA fragments by size, again with the smaller fragments moving the furthest. So small fragments would be down here, and larger fragments would be stuck at the top of the gel. Here's what the product of gel olecrophoresis might look like. You have wells up here where the DNA fragments are loaded into the gel, and then we apply an electrical current where the positive electrode is down here, the negative electrode is up here, so DNA, since it's negatively charged, will move down the gel towards that positive electrode. If I look, the fragments of DNA are shown here, and usually at one or either ends of the gel, we have something known as a ladder or a standard where we take known fragments of DNA and we allow them to be run down the gel so that we can compare our unknown sizes with the actual known sizes from the ladder or standard. If you ever see something kind of like this, where there is a long smear, that's usually a mixture of genomic DNA fragments of varying sizes. And then if you see fragments at the very top, that means those, those fragments were usually too big to pass through the pores of the gel. So they just form a single band at the top. Um, different ways to visualize these results include using fluorescent dyes fluorescent dyes, and that's something shown here. Um, some of these dyes cannot be visualized unless you use something like UV light, which is being shown on the right side. In our class, we can use stains as well, and we're going to be using a stain called methylene blue in our lab when we run our gel electrophoresis of DNA fragments. Here's another look. Um, I like this picture on the left. It shows me the wells where I'm going to load my fragments. On the far right, this is my ladder. This is a lane where I add DNA fragments of known sizes, and this is in kilo base pairs in terms of size. So five indicates, for example, 5,000 base pairs. And I can see small fragments are at the bottom, larger fragments at the top. And how I use my ladder is if I have a fragment such as this one, fragment B, I know it traveled pretty far down the gel, but I don't know, I don't know exactly how, how big it is. So I can kind of compare how far it traveled down the gel compared to my ladder or my known sizes, and I can estimate that it's probably about 10 kilo base pairs long. On the right, you can see it looks like the same thing. Some kind of fluorescent dye was used to stain the gel, and you're applying UV light to see the DNA fragments. And in some cases, you can actually cut out to the bands and re-isolate that fragment of DNA to study it further. Our next technique is something known as polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. And this is used to amplify or make many copies of nucleic acids really specifically a fragment of DNA or RNA. So again, we're trying to amplify a specific sequence, and usually it's of DNA. We need a few things in order to do this, including primers. Primers are small pieces of DNA that are complementary to the end of our target sequence that we're trying to amplify. So here, if I have a double-stranded DNA molecule, 5 to 3, and let's say this is 5 prime to 3 prime over here, and there's a fragment over here that I'm trying to amplify, then my primers would be flanking the ends. My primers would be over here and here. I also need TAC DNA polymerase, which is the enzyme that will replicate the DNA of interest, amplify that particular segment of DNA. And of course, I need deoxynucleotides, which are my bases, right? My ATGC. Those nucleotides are needed. So TAC DNA polymerase is a special type of DNA polymerase that was isolated from a type of bacterium called Thermus aquaticus that can survive well in high temperatures. So this is a type of DNA polymerase enzyme that does not denature or uncoil even when it's 
uh, put into a very high temperature environment, which is needed for PCR to occur. So usually we run PCR on DNA. If for any reason you have an RNA fragment instead, you can also replicate or amplify this RNA fragment using a procedure called RT-PCR, reverse transcriptase polymerase chain reaction. And in this case, what you would do is you would take your RNA and first convert it to DNA using reverse transcriptase enzyme that was discovered in viruses. When you take RNA and you turn it back into DNA, it's known as a special type of DNA, oops, sorry, that should say DNA, called complementary DNA. So this is complementary DNA. And this is different from regular RNA, uh, regular DNA, excuse me, because complementary DNA does not have introns, no introns. Remember that in eukaryotic cells, messenger RNA is processed and you cut out the introns to get your final messenger RNA product. Because of this, when I take RNA and turn it back into DNA, this is complementary DNA because it does not have introns since it was already processed during that processing from pre-mRNA to messenger RNA. So here are the detailed steps of PCR, polymerase chain reaction. There are three main steps. Denaturation, which occurs at a high temperature that's needed to separate the two strands of DNA, of my double-stranded DNA. Then I have step two, annealing, which is at a lower temperature, and this is when my primers will bind to the DNA. And then my third step is DNA synthesis, which is when TAC DNA polymerase takes my free nucleotides and uses them to build my complementary strand of DNA. So let's look at cycle one. I start with one double-stranded DNA molecule, and I heat it up, denaturation, to separate the two strands. I'm breaking those hydrogen bonds that can connected A to T or G to C, etc. In step two, annealing, that sample is cooled, so my primers can bind to their complementary sequence, which are going to flank the specific sequence of DNA that I'm trying to amplify. In step three, DNA synthesis, it's warmer again, and this is when I take TAC DNA polymerase, and I take my free DNA nucleotides, and I build my complementary sequence of DNA. So after the end of the first cycle, I have two double-stranded molecules of DNA. I've doubled what I started with. After the second cycle, you can see I have one, two, three, four. And then after the third cycle, I have eight copies, eight double-stranded copies of my DNA. So PCR is exponential. I start with one, after the first cycle I have two, then I have four after the third cycle, 8, 16, etc. So after 30 cycles, you have as many as a billion copies of your single starting double stranded DNA molecule. So usually you can estimate how much you have by using an exponent. Since you're doubling every time, you can look at how many cycles, where n would be the number of cycles of PCR. Additional biotechnology related techniques are shown here, including southern blotting and northern blotting. Southern blotting is when you're looking at DNA. So southern blotting is DNA, and it usually happens after you run gel electrophoresis to separate DNA fragments by size. In order to use or perform southern blotting experiments, what you do next is after running your gel, you set up your DNA so that it's going to be transferred from the gel to some kind of nylon membrane. Sometimes we use something called a nitrocellulose membrane. So we have usually some buffer, something uh, buffer liquid. We have our filter paper, our gel, and our nylon membrane is above it with paper towels above that to attract the liquid towards the upper surface and the DNA will get trapped on the nylon membrane. You can't see the DNA when it's on the nylon membrane, 
but then you take the membrane and you bathe it in a solution that contains DNA probes. DNA probes are short pieces of DNA that are complementary to the sequence of interest of the DNA fragments on your gel. And this can be visualized because these probes are usually tagged with some kind of fluorescent label or dye so that we can see when the probe binds to the DNA on the gel. So southern blotting occurs again after gel electrophoresis when DNA is transferred to a nylon membrane and probes are added to identify complementary DNA sequences of interest that were in your gel. For northern blotting, this is very similar. It would be a similar process, except instead of DNA, we would be looking at RNA. We would run RNA onto a gel, transfer the RNA into a nylon membrane, and then add RNA probes. Finally, I don't have it in the title here, but we also have something known as western blotting. And in western blotting, we're looking at proteins. We're gonna run proteins on a gel, transfer them to a nylon membrane, and instead of using probes, when we get to proteins, we use something called antibodies. Antibodies are going to be added to the nylon membrane to identify specific proteins of interest. One application of the southern blot is DNA fingerprinting. DNA fingerprinting allows us to identify individuals based on their unique DNA sequences. So since we all have unique DNA sequences, unless you are an identical twin, in which case you won't have a unique sequence. If we do have unique sequences, we can take advantage of restriction enzymes, which recognize specific DNA sequences and will cut everyone's DNA differently due to that slight difference in nucleotide sequence. DNA fingerprinting can be used in crime scenes or for paternal tests. So here on the left, I have an example of four, four individuals, a mom, a dad, and their two children. If the children are related to the parents, you'll see that the bands, their specific cuts using those restriction enzymes will match one parent or the other. So this one looks like it's from the mom. That one's probably from the mom too. This one's from the dad. For the children, about half of their fragments will come from mom and the other half of the fragments will come from dad. And that takes us to the end of our first video. In our second video, we're going to be looking at cloning and genetic engineering.